Today I'm going to show you how to make an ester because they're really easy to make, but more importantly, I'm working on what I believe to be a Dr. Pepper recipe that I found in a book from the 1950s. And it calls for a specific ester that I'm having a hard time sourcing, so I just decided to make it and I thought I'd take you along for the ride because esters are probably one of the most abundant flavor compounds we use, and so knowing more about them will help you work with flavors better. So I've done a video on esters before, you can check it out here. And just for a quick review, an ester is made from an alcohol and an acid, specifically a carboxylic acid. And you can actually mix and match any way you want and be able to form an ester. And in the video I did before, the best example is using acetic acid with ethanol, so vinegar and drinking alcohol. If you mix those two together, sometimes heat or just leave for a long period of time, you will form ethyl acetate. And it's a fruity, ethereal kind of ester. In high concentrations, it's got kind of an acetone smell. So distillers tend to notice it, but it's simple. And today I am going to be making isoamyl formate. So I just need isoamyl alcohol and formic acid. Now, these two, even though formic acid is a strong acid, it will react you know, fairly quickly. It's gonna take a few hours at 50 to 60 degrees Celsius to actually get the reaction to happen. I'm still gonna add some phosphoric acid to this, like one mil in 100 mils, so 1%, just to catalyze the reaction, help speed it up. Esters do form easily, but they do need a, you know, to be coaxed into that formation. Otherwise, you have to wait long periods of time for it to happen. Major production, so they use sulfuric acid, but I'm sticking to all food grade components for this. So everything I use today is approved for food use, and anything that comes out of this is food, or can be used in food. So other than the alcohol and the acid, and the phosphoric acid catalyst. We only need two other ingredients to get this done. We're going to need some sodium bicarbonate or potassium bicarbonate. And sodium bicarbonate is just baking soda. Potassium bicarbonate is just the potassium equivalent. You can get both of these online. I want to use potassium bicarbonate. It's just for a solubility thing. I'll explain what I'm doing the reaction, but you could get away with using sodium bicarbonate. And then the last ingredient is sodium sulfate. I use this one in the mineral water video. This is anhydrous. So when it's exposed to water, it's going to try to bind up the water. And we wanna pull out as much water from the final product and keep it as dry as possible because water is kind of technically the enemy of an ester. If you have too much water in an ester, it's going to revert back to its starting components. So back to the acid and the alcohol, and that's not what we want because the, the flavor change is significant. That's why fresh pressed juice tastes awesome. And then juice that's been in your fridge for a month doesn't taste awesome because uh, basically a lot of the esters are breaking down because there's more water than alcohol, usually no alcohol in juices. So it's gonna break down those esters. Now the reaction doesn't happen super fast. Like I said, it could take weeks. Yeah, sometimes it could take days if it's warm, but in a fridge, it's gonna take a few weeks to a month for all those esters to break down. That's about it for the quick review on esters. So let me show you how to make some amyl formate and give me a second to set up. So as I mentioned, making this ester is simple. You don't need a lot of equipment to do it. I'm gonna do it in this heating mantle. I'll use it for distillation, but you could do it on a hot plate with a stirrer and a flat flask. And then the only other, this is more for safety. We're not gonna be boiling anything, but I do like to put this reflux condenser in there. It's passive, so you don't need any cooling or water source. It'll just help condense any vapors that you know, happen to get above the top of the flask. You never wanna bring anything to temperature and have it sealed. So this allows it to be open to the atmosphere, so no pressurized glass, but condensing vapors. Now these work on both, so you could do that if you wanted, if you weren't in, interested in investing this, but you already had one of these, uh, they will work. Now, beyond that, we just need our kitchen scale. This is the 500 gram, two digit balance you get for about $20, $25, and you will need a separatory funnel. 
You can use the open mouth funnels from the extract video. These ones are just more accurate because they have a much uh, better taper at the bottom. So when we separate out the water on this, this is where this comes in handy. But beyond that, I recommend gloves and safety glasses. This is a strong acid. Phosphoric acid is a strong acid. You do not want to get it in your eyes. You get it on your hands, but you wash immediately. Otherwise you will get burns, especially from this and this. If you wonder why I wear green gloves, I've been wearing these since the 90s. I've gotten used to them. I know where my hands are at all times, especially when using like rotating equipment and stuff. So I just happen to like them. Now, the first thing we're going to do is weigh out 69 grams of 85% formic acid. Now I've decanted it into a beaker just because this bottle does not pour well. So we need 69. This one doesn't have to be super accurate. So that's 70.62. I'm actually going to take out a little bit just because otherwise I have to neutralize it at the end. So we'll go for 68.89 and that will be sufficient for what we need. And then you just simply pour that straight into the reaction flask. Now the next step is to add 100 mils of isoamyl alcohol to this beaker. So that's 99.88, so that's close enough. I do want to add a magnetic stir to this, and we are going to turn this on and get some stirring going. We're going to pull this up a little bit. We want it in the liquid, but not affecting the stir. Now, when you add the alcohol to the formic acid, do it slowly. It may generate heat. I don't believe it actually produces enough heat to boil anything, but you do want it slow just to make sure you don't produce too much heat. And you do want to do it with lots of stirring. So now that you have all of this in here, you just want to increase the stirring and let it stir for a minute or two, just kind of any reaction that's going to happen, but it's still quite cold. So, uh, you will see some people do this on ice just to prevent any reaction. And you should always go cautiously when doing this, just because unless you know exactly how things are going to react together, they can generate heat when they're mixed. And sometimes that heat is enough to boil whichever component has the, the lightest boiling point, And then it can come flying out of the flask. Usually you don't get too many explosions in a lab. Usually what you end up with is just splashing you know, formic acid everywhere, which is not a good thing. I could test, I could feel this. There's no heat going on. So what we're going to do is we're going to add one mil of our phosphoric acid drop wise. So I just use a disposable pipette and that gets me roughly one mil. And you can actually feel it warming up as I add the phosphoric acid. It's not hot, but you can just definitely feel that there is um, some heat coming from that reaction. Okay, now at this point, I'm just going to take off the funnel and put that on. And then we'll start to increase the temperature and see if we can get this reaction going. So this is a thermocouple. It's tied into this controller. And if we set it at 55 degrees Celsius, we should be good. So I do notice that the, the temperature did go up on this. So there's either some heating from the mantle or the reaction temperature increased it. But we're just going to let this run for a couple hours. So I'd recommend three to four hours. Probably happen quicker. Typically you don't want to leave these by themselves. So don't go too far away from it. I'll clean up and do a bunch of other things, but I will check on this regularly over the next three hours. And then I will check back with you and we'll start the process of purification. So now this has been going for about three hours. I'm going to turn down the temperature on this, but I do want to keep the stirring going. So we're going to drop it down to you know, room temperature. But the stirring is still important at this stage because we're going to add this potassium bicarbonate. You can use sodium bicarbonate. It's a different amount, but I'll write that all up on Patreon. 
And this potassium bicarbonate is going to neutralize the excess formic acid we had in here that pushed towards esterification. You will notice that there is some vapor in this column and uh, this just prevents it from coming out in the atmosphere. And there is no smell in here right now. So we just take that off. And then what we're gonna do is put this funnel on just to make it easier. But we're gonna do this slowly because we do not want to dump all of this in because it will expand too rapidly, too much carbon dioxide, and it will, you know, come flying out of the reaction vessel. So uh, this is a point where you do want to be cautious. And there is a little bit of vapor coming off, but that's okay. You can let the temperature go down on this before you add this, but uh, it should be fine. It's not creating any heat. Now the reason I'm using potassium bicarbonate instead of sodium bicarbonate is that when this reacts with the formic acid, you're going to get potassium formate, which is three times more soluble in water than sodium formate. The amount of water when we put this into a separatory funnel is gonna be really small. So the idea is to try to dissolve all the potassium formate into that small amount of water so we don't actually have to do a filtration step. Otherwise, with the, or with the sodium bicarbonate, you may need to do a filtration step because all of the sodium bicarbonate may not dissolve in there. Now I've got all the potassium bicarbonate into there, except for some stuck on this funnel. Uh, easy solution to that, we're just going to take out the thermocouple Set that on paper. And then we're gonna remove the clamp. And then use a pipette. Get a small sample and wash. And that should get most of it. Now you can smell the ester in here. It's not very strong, but you can definitely smell it a little bit from the vapors. It should do this in a well-ventilated area and definitely no open flames because this is flammable. Now at this stage, I'm just gonna transfer it to the separatory funnel. Take this back out. And as you can see, there's this saturated layer and you can still see some of the potassium bicarbonate working on that. So do not close this. Now this bottom layer here is the water layer. So we're going to discard that. The ester that we want to keep is on top. So once this stops bubbling, we will just basically let it separate. The colder this is, the better your separation will be has to do with solubility. The colder, the closer to zero or freezing you get, the less soluble things become. So this is still warm. You know, it's kind of body temperature right now. So I'm gonna let this cool down to room temperature. A lot of chemistry is about getting high yields. I'm not worried about my yield so much as I just need this ester. So if I only get an 80% yield, I am fine with that. We may have an additional washing step after this, uh, just to make sure that we get out all of the formic acid and any of the alcohol, uh, just in case the reaction didn't go to completion. Though usually these reactions are pretty good. So I'll just leave this go, cool down, and then we'll jump back when I go to the separation stage. So now this is the final step. I'm gonna drain off this bottom water layer. And as you can see on the top layer here, it's a little bit hazy. That's the water that's entrained or dissolved in the ester. There's not a lot of it, but there's enough to make it hazy. And we're gonna use our sodium sulfate and hydrous to dry that. And we're gonna use about 15 grams of it. So let me just drain this off. So you just do it slowly until it gets to the bottom. 
Now that gets rid of all the water. And off camera, I did drain it once before and added some fresh water just to rinse it out. Really, really cold water though, when this is chilled. These esterification reactions don't happen really, really quickly, but they can if it's hot. So generally keep your temperature low with water and you should be fine. Now we're just going to take the remainder here of our ester. And it definitely smells like an ester. Now at this point, we're going to add a stir bar. Turn this on, get it rotating. And then we're gonna add our sodium sulfate. Now that will dry up or basically bind with the water. And you can already see it forming kind of a, a paste. And this is actually getting clearer. So it happens pretty quickly. So just let this stir for 10 to 15 minutes. Now, basically we're gonna be left with our pure ester. It'll be ready to use. So you can just run this through a filter or decant it off, whichever works for you, but just separate out the uh, sodium sulfate and discard it. But that's basically how you make an ester. And I've really simplified this and there aren't really any notes other than, you know, when I do things in front of a camera, I'm worrying about the camera, so I'm, I tend to rush a little bit, just or focusing on a bunch of different things. The one step I would say is instead of adding the sodium bicarbonate while it was hot, yeah, let it cool down to room temperature. Uh, that's the only suggestion, but otherwise, this is actually cleared up perfectly. So I'm all set to go. Next video, we'll talk about Dr. Pepper. And if you want to know all the equipment and all the information about this, where to get some of this stuff, I'll just post it over on Patreon. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.